I'm really envisioning some information, but mostly an informal exchange. I'd love to hear more from you. I know that uh, Juliet is going to have some additional questions and information she's going to want to glean from you. So um, I'd like to just kind of start by talking about my background. Um, I'm a, I come from a small business background, but I found myself working more and more with economic yeah. development professionals. And in working with the city, recognizing more and more how much our city was awarding contracts and our state warning, awarding contracts to companies that, in my mind, weren't bringing real value to the state of Arizona. And so, you know, in, in the work that I was doing in encouraging people to support locally owned businesses, we did several economic studies that really looked at the true value of a contract. And so, um, in 2007 is when I first started really working in procurement and helping to better define what the value of a contract might be. And so early on, we started having a, a conversation there about whether or not we were talking in terms of through a procurement lens, if we were talking about economic development or were we talking about economic leakage. And so we're going to focus on ways procurement reflects either economic development or leakage and depending on the way the contracts are awarded. So often we are simply just mandated, as they are in the state of Arizona, to get the cheapest price. And so what we're doing is asking the question, what really is the cheapest price? And, and pointing out that oftentimes that cheap is costing a fortune in a lot of different ways. So we're going to be talking a little bit about that. We're going to be talking about um, the way that, as Juliet and, um, and uh, Samantha mentioned, the, the City of Phoenix's approach, how we've been able to shift that through about five years of work in uh, helping them even today. Uh, we're working to help them build up their vendor database of quality local vendors so that they have a better uh, competition and more um, choices when they do their uh, contract awarding. And then finally, um, how we can th you know, think more broadly about procurement and thinking about even where our money is invested, which banks are holding our money. How is that working out for our businesses and our surrounding community? So they're just some of the things that we're going to touch on. Um, now, yesterday we talked about this because I just want to get on the same page um, about you know, a simple way that we can think about how the economy works. And how many of you were in any of the discussions yesterday? Okay. So, um, so I'm just going to explain. I put this slide up there because I think that a lot of folks have become a little disconnected from how the economy works. Not necessarily you in this room, but hopefully this provides you with a tool that you can go out and talk to other people about why you're uh, working to procure more goods locally. So I use this slide to just to get folks thinking, everyday folks that aren't in the business world. Um, you know, we've got 15 Starbucks locations on this side of the slide and 15 independent coffee shops here. And even though Starbucks, uh, you know, they pay for the health care of their employees, which is a great thing. And even though Starbucks actually isn't in the business of incentives, they pay their own way when they move into a town, I'm still going to demonstrate how spending money at a Starbucks means economic leakage, m money moving out of the community. So I asked folks in the audience, um, you know, you spend your money on a latte at Starbucks, how many accountants do they hire here in Fairbanks or even in Alaska because Starbucks does business here? Clearly the answer is none. They don't hire any accountants here in Alaska, nor do they hire local graphic designers or website developers or payroll service providers or attorneys. And the number, that just goes on and on and on. It's a very long list. And we call those secondary jobs. Yes. So if I go to Starbucks, it means we could have less attorneys and servants? It absolutely does. It absolutely does. Um, over here, you got 15 accountants have a client, 15 website developers have a gig, 15 payroll service providers or whatever it might be. So those represent dollars moving through the economy. So you spent your money and that money then has gone off into the hands of somebody else and you're supporting an additional job or at least a partial job. Now we can talk about the third time a dollar moves through the economy when let's say the janitorial supply company gets hired by the accounting firm and the only reason the accounting firm is here is because the local company hires them. So when you blow this up into, you know, you could have 30,000 Starbucks locations across the country and you're still going to have one accountant. You're going to have one graphic designer. This guy likes this, this model because you're going to have one attorney. 
right? So my point is that by supporting this, this chain model that gets replicated across the country, now we're told it's, it's because of economy of scale, right? But we know it's not cheaper to buy a latte at Starbucks. And so this just sets the, the, the stage for what I want to talk to you about, how procurement officers actually can be a part of economic reliability, resilience. They can be a part of economic uh, sustainability. Um, they can actually drive jobs and dollars moving in a local economy if we think together about how we can measure the true value of a contract. So this, this slide really kind of lays it out. That, um, and this is a true fact, that many, many chain stores uh, have opened up across America, and we can now prove that for every two jobs they created, three total jobs were lost, okay? Because we weren't thinking about the true value. So um, I'm gonna get into a little bit of the detail of the first economic study we did. So these pie charts represent a $5 million contract that the state of Arizona has with Staples. Um, at the time we did this contract, um, we measured three big companies. Um, they were Wist Office Products, which is an Arizona-owned company. They've been there for three generations, and they are plenty big to handle a contract this size. We measured Staples, and we measured Office Max. So Staples and Office Max are both large companies, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, and they have a, uh, even have a, pre a heavy presence in Arizona. So these pie charts represent the dollars that were retained and used in Arizona's economy. So you have spent $5 million with WIST, 33.4% of that money would have stayed and recirculated in the state of Arizona. But instead, we spent it over here at the time with OfficeMax, and only 11% eleven of, of it stayed. So that's three times more of the money that could have stayed and recirculated. And so, you know, the, I think the, the common response is, but I'm sure that that you know, Office Max was cheaper. And so I'm trying to get us away from that language because I'm gonna to demonstrate to you that actually Office Max was much, much more expensive in time, okay? So the methodology we looked at uh, was good jobs versus per, poor jobs. The first thing I wanna point out is that both Staples and Office Max have 64, 65% part-time employees with no healthcare benefits. Those employees end up on the state of Arizona's healthcare program. And so the taxpayers, the same people that are paying for the office supplies, are also paying for the health care. So the way I break this out in, in my community, I'll get somebody, I own a music store. So I'll say, who's a music lover, right? Get somebody to raise their hand. I'll say, okay, I'll make you a deal. 50% off forevermore, forevermore, your lifetime. All you have to do is pay for the health care of my employees. And they'll go, no, I don't want to do that. And I'll say, well, exactly. But that's what we do on a regular basis when we only ask ourselves, what is the cheapest price? So the second was charitable contributions. We found out that WIST gave $35,000 a year to Arizona charities and had done so every year for the last 10 years, as far back as their records go, even though they've been there 40 some years, they had records to prove an average of $35,000 a year for the last 10 years. Staples and Office Max could not pay, to, they couldn't point to anything that they had given in the state of Arizona. So that's another way dollars recirculate. And then the third is the second tier jobs I was just talking about. WIST, by spending money at WIST, they in turn hire local graphic designers, website developers, payroll service providers. They had a list of 18 to 20 businesses in Arizona that they in turn support with the money they bring in on contracts. Staples and Office Max, none. That money leaves Arizona's economy immediately. So when you factor in over a five-year contract the amount of money that stays in the state of Arizona, Office Max has more than Staples because at least they have a regional distribution facility. Staples actually packs and processes our orders in the state of California and ships them over via FedEx. So one way to look at this is our state just spent $5 million and didn't create a single job. They didn't retain a single job. In fact, they may have eliminated jobs because Staples is there trying to put both Office Max and WIST out of business. So we need to factor all those things in uh, when we talk about the cost. So um, this is a quote from Dan Houston. Um, I don't know if you all in the back can read that. Can you read that? I'll just leave it then. I'm not going to read it to you. 
The long and short is they proved we were losing a half million dollars a year on a $5 million contract, five-year contract, year over year over year. So this is a way to be thinking about procurement. And I love procurement folks in my community because I'm like, you guys, you're actually able to create more jobs than any elected official. It's in your hands, right? You absolutely have the ability to do this. So one of the things I just wanted to share uh, with you is that um, the state of Texas has been um, awarding contracts differently than the rest of the states for many, many years. And if you look at a chart, like the feds just put out a state chart um, in terms of economic recovery, um, measuring which states were the first versus the last to reach pre-recession levels of economic activity. The state of Texas was number one. They have over 500 community banks and their procurement laws are such that they're measuring the true value of the contract. They maintain an entire federal directory that shows all the different states and what they're doing for procurement. So this, um, you know, this close after election, don't associate my red and blue squares with anything, uh, anything else. What we're basically saying is that these red states have a tie bid preference and a resident bidder preference. So that means that if you're going to do business in any of those states that are red, from an outsider's perspective, you're going to have to beat their companies by a certain percentage. So if you want to do business in the state of Texas, Texas companies have a 5% preference right out of the gate. I'm not necessarily standing here in front of you and advocating for that or against that. In a perfect world, I would rather measure the true value rather than add a preference. I'm, I'm, I'm not advocating for a preference. Um, I'm not advocating to interrupt free markets. I believe in competition, I want competition, but too often we just award contracts to the bigger companies making the assumption they're gonna be cheaper, or we even partner with others, like in the state of Arizona, our universities and our cities just jump onto the state's contract because they assume the state did the best job of negotiating the best contract. When we started doing this research, we found that municipalities and universities hadn't even audited their contracts in three years or more. So that meant that they signed on the line saying, we want this stapler, and, and Staples said, okay, those are 12 cents when everybody else's were $1.89, and then conveniently Staples was out of that stapler every single time, and they substituted in the $1.89 stapler. And they've been busted on this. They're actually facing three state lawsuits right now for bait and switch. So we just get into the habit of thinking bigger is better, and we're not maintaining relationships and making sure we actually get what we ordered and we make sure that the value is there. So this, back to this again, the, um, the, the resident bidders have a preference. The reciprocal law, that means that, let's just say uh, the state of Colorado over there is gonna do business with the state of Texas. Colorado has a 3% preference, Texas has a 5%. If you come from the state of Colorado into the state of Texas to do business, you have to beat their best guy by 5% or more. So they're doing reciprocal language and making sure that they're um, competing, uh, they're, they're sort of one-upping each other. And then you see the green states have nothing for resident bidders at all. And there's four of us, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, Arizona, and anybody? I forget, whatever that other tiny state is up there. Um, so um, we in the state of Arizona have created three Senate bills over the years to work on this. Um, I don't have enough money to have a lobbying firm. You're looking at our lobbying team right now. And if I can get in front of people, I can convince them that there's a problem here and then there's massive economic leakage occurring. But if I can't get in front of them, there is a tendency for people to think that we're trying to interrupt free markets and we're kind of trying to jump in and favor the boo-hoo locals who are incompetent and too expensive and we're going to waste taxpayer money. This is not my goal. It's not realistic. And anybody that was with me yesterday learned I want local businesses to be better. I want it to be more competitive. And I think there's ways to get them there. Um, but I'm certainly not asking anybody in the room to spend any more money. It's not what I'm trying to do. So... Um, 
So just to give you a sense, in the, the um, third attempt at the state legislature, I just wanted reciprocal language, meaning we would not have a state preference at all, but if somebody from Texas was trying to win in California, because they have a 5% preference, they would have to meet our, beat our best guy by 5% or more to win the contract. The state of Arizona does not even have a tie bid preference right now. That means if a solid Arizona company is up against a California company and they have the exact same numbers, they, throw, they draw a Lots. They throw it blindly into a hat and choose. So we even lose 50% of those. So it is an ongoing conversation. Um, now that my organization has grown, I don't have the time I used to have when it was just me. I used to actually focus on that quite a lot. The last couple of years, I've grown from having five employees to 20. So I'll be circling back on it soon. But that gives you an overview. Um, that state, which I'd be happy to provide that website for you, it actually keeps track and and uh, lists all the different states and what they're currently doing. So now I'm going to talk about companies and what I call anchor institutions. So this would be universities, hospitals, businesses, anything that's not necessarily government related. So we did another study. Uh, this one was in 2011 and looking at the purchasing habits of, co of uh, what was then called Copper Point Mutual uh, or SCF Arizona, same company, they just changed their name. Uh, they are the state's largest uh, workers' compensation uh, health care provider. And they heard my talk and they said, you know, we think we could be doing more for Arizona's economy, so we'd like to sit down with you, sort of measure um, what it is we're doing. So we sat down with them for about two months, worked through all of their numbers, looked at their purchasing, looked at the companies they were buying from, and in that assessment we determined they were sourcing 42% of their goods and services locally from other Arizona companies. We were able to sit down and uh, measure what things they weren't sourcing locally and to spend the time to go out and find those things that they could be sourcing locally, help them negotiate deals, and we got them from 42 to 82 percent of their goods and services sourced locally. Then we came in and did a measurement. Well, what does that mean? Number one, we saved them 1 percent on their total budget. We saved them 1 percent we reduce their carbon footprint significantly because now they're sourcing more and they don't have to ship things in. I mean, our university, they get things drop shipped. I know shipping here is a much different scenario than in Arizona, but I do want to say we were having things drop shipped on 18 wheelers to our university from Staples. When they switched to WIST, they get one shipment because it's just right there in Tempe. So that's also something else to consider. So the, the other key findings we had after they sourced 82%, um, number one, they spent $100 million, but we proved it had a half a billion dollar impact on Arizona's economy by the time those dollars stayed and recirculated through secondary and tertiary jobs and all the other touches that it had. And then finally, um, while they directly employ 518 people, that's how many people wake up every day and put their pants on and say, I work for SCF or Copper Point. We prove they're indirectly supporting 3,600 Arizona jobs. And those other jobs are in manufacturing, medical supplies, and on and on and on and on. So we've been able to take that contract and go out to our utility companies, our um, universities, and others to get them to just commit to small shifts. Uh, nobody's going to be 100% local, but if they could do small shifts to keep more money reverberating, keep more jobs at home, it makes a huge difference. So um, we, APS committed to shifting 5% more a year. Um, uh, SRP committed to shifting 10% total. Um, our universities have been finding things that they can switch. And so what I'm doing at Local First Arizona is I'm creating an entire program that's called Source AZ. And Source AZ is going to be a matchmaking service between our anchor institutions and our vendors that will then begin to um, uh, create more local contracts, save the anchor institutions money, and create more Arizona jobs while we're doing it. Uh, one of the things that I'm working on right now is to make that a self-reliant program underneath our umbrella. I can't constantly be throwing money at, um, at that. So what I'm doing is all of my, what I'm calling preferred vendors, are companies that are going to win new contracts. They have to drive a rebate back to my organization. So right now we have a guinea pig out there. It's our office supply company. We, they drive a 4% rebate to our foundation for any new contracts that I bring them. So I brought them Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona. They have uh, half the city of Phoenix's 
purchasing now, and that one deal right now is driving twenty-five, twenty-six thousand dollars back to our foundation, so that I can continue to grow staff to build that program to go out and, and make more matches. So we believe we're going to be leading the nation in terms of leveraging our procurement spend to drive jobs and uh, and uh, revenue into the state. So. There's a couple of things I just wanted to talk to you about. One is we are um, proactively working with a mining company in the state of Arizona. They're, it's a Rio Tinto owns the mine, but it's run by Resolution Copper in the state. Resolution Copper just found what they believe is going to be the largest copper mine in the world. And it's in a small town called Superior. It's a town that used to be 12,000 people. Today it's 2,700 people. Median income there is under $20,000 a year. They have one tiny little grocery store. They have a lot of dilapidated housing storefronts. Um, and they have contracted with my organization to go in and do an assessment and help them figure out um, how they can begin to be rebuild that town. Um, they're hoping within three to five years they're actually going to be mining. Right now they can't get anybody to move there because the services and the lifestyle, the quality of life is as low as it is. So one of the things we're doing with them proactively is we're developing a regional database for them to source from because they recognize that if they're going to be buying this stuff, they may as well be buying it from companies within what they call the Copper Corridor. So there's a string of about 10 towns along in there and we're building a database that not only they are going to be sourcing from, but they are requiring all of their contractors to also source from it. Their strategy is that if we can invest in these companies and they can grow jobs, that all boats will rise and that you'll see more quality of life, better housing stock moving in, and people will start to respond to that. So that's their plan over the next 10 years. And again, I think they're going to be mining within three to five years. So that's quite remarkable that they've actually hired us to build that database and we're out doing the research for them for that now. Um, and then the last story I wanted to share with you again with thinking about how involved the city of Phoenix is, is, has been. Um, I run a restaurant coalition. We've got about 35 uh, fine dining establishments in Phoenix that are in a coalition. I'm trying to get them to be more sustainable in their practices. And I went out and I found this guy that does 100% uh, recycled post-consumer non-bleached napkins. And uh, I brought him in and the, and the restaurant said, you know, Kimber, we love you, but ain't no way we're buying those napkins. They're too expensive, like not going to do it. So I went back to the guy manufacturing the napkins and I said, you know, dude, what are you doing? Why are your prices so high? And he said, I know, I know if I could just get the capital to build, to, to have more equipment, I could increase my production. And since I have these restaurants lined up, I could lower my price. And so I went into the city of Phoenix economic development and I said, hey, I've got this guy who wants to grow his company. I've got 35 restaurants that would sign on a line that would buy these napkins, you know, and right now they're helping him assess what his needs are to figure out how they could build a company, help him build his company and use those restaurants to leverage uh, any financial, uh, any capital that he needs to build uh, via Viva Banking. So um, the city of Phoenix has rolled up their sleeves and said, how can we make a marriage here? Because we would have literally a closed circle. The restaurants creating the food waste, going to the composting company that is then pounding it into paper product that the napkin manufacturer can use to sell back to the restaurants who then create the compost that goes back. I mean, we'd have a closed loop with all those jobs growing. So that gives you an idea and an overview, and I'd like to open it up for any discussions or any questions that you may have. Is this helpful? Yeah? Anybody have any questions or thoughts? So anything you can think of that we could provide that would be helpful? Uh, you're up here in rural Alaska. Certainly, yeah. Idaho and Montana are the two states that I've talked to that can that that are in a similar situation. But I can say that I would even view that theirs is even a little bit different than yours. You know, Idaho being you know snuggled up next to a lot of even though their biggest town is thirty five thousand, um, their neighboring states are are significantly bigger. 
Um, and I don't mean to breeze in and make it sound like it's going to be easy, but I also think that there are some opportunities here to grow companies working in partnership. And um, I think that there are ways to break off chunks of procurement um, as an investment and not necessarily try to do a, a huge big contract, but maybe some of it and let companies grow and begin to prepare for dealing with bigger contracts. So. So I agree with Idaho being kind of snuggled up in there. The Montana would be a mm -hmm. more parallel dimensional where it's totally different than those 48. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I was uh, working with the folks in Billings. Food for thought or anything we, that you could recommend a parallel uh, to us to analyze uh, your concept in more rural development or rural areas mm -hmm. that would help. Uh, the, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, one of the things that we're working on for, um, for other rural towns, again, I think that the, the key here is, is being willing to start small. Um, and um, so some of the things that we do uh, working with the, I mean, I've worked in towns on some of this that go all the way down to, you know, 2,700 people um, because the companies that are there, almost 100% of them are leaving the town to buy whatever they need. You know, they drive two hours to stock up on everything. And so what we've been able to do is um, just a simple example. Uh, there's a guy that sells appliances in a small town uh, in sort of southeastern Arizona, and somehow he had managed to survive all of these years. And we did a survey and found out that the companies that were there, you know, your restaurants, if they need, um, commercial dishwashers, whatever it might be, they didn't even look his way. They immediately went into Tucson, which is about two hours away to source everything. And so we asked him, hey, what do you, what do you feel like you're most competitive on? And he gave us a list of the things that he thought he was most competitive on. And so we went to Tucson and, and compared apples to apples, and he was more expensive on every single one of them. But then we factored in the gas to get to Tucson, and then we factored in the fact that he would haul away old appliances for free, whereas if you buy it from the guy in Tucson, you gotta pay somebody 50 or 100 bucks to haul away an old appliance, and then suddenly he became cheaper. He also was really eager to help, and so if he didn't have something in stock, he'd be willing to order it, and he would do whatever it took. And so we've been able to increase his business by over 100% in the last year, just because we got people thinking about why, why are we doing it this way? And uh, we did it with a pharmacy, um, uh, a pharmacy that created a, a new job. So sometimes it's just a shift like that can create a, a new job. And, and sometimes it, it's not that much effort to do. It doesn't cost any more money to do. And then suddenly in a small town, you know, creating a handful of jobs can sometimes make a big difference. I, was, I told a story yesterday, this pharmacy really was pretty amazing. Um, I did interviews in a town, and again, this is more B to, B to consume, business to consumer, but nonetheless, 100% of the people that I interviewed were getting their prescriptions filled about an hour and away in a much more affluent town. And I thought, my first thought was they didn't have any pharmacy there. Well, then I found out they did, and my second thought was, well, they must be outrageously expensive, and I found out they're not. So then I dug a little deeper. Why isn't anybody buying their, their pharmacy here? It was at a clinic, actually. It was because they only opened up their pharmacy on Tuesday afternoons, and you had to go down there and stand with your neighbors in a line, and everybody, there was no privacy about it. You, everybody knew what you were picking up. And so people were willing to drive an hour to avoid that, you know, running into your neighbors and standing in line. And so we really sat down with that pharmacy and said, you, you guys have to, to change this, and they did, and they offer a lot more privacy now, and they've been able to create at least one job that I know of. So what we just call this a reducing economic leakage, right? And so I mean, there's a tendency to go, well, what about the guy down the street? Well, that was a Walgreens, you know, and just because there's 180 less people driving an hour to come to that Walgreens doesn't mean that Walgreens is going to go anywhere and they're not going to lay anybody off. It's just a Walgreens, so. Anybody else? All right. So one thing that might be useful, kind of get a conversation going, um, would be. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and sit here. These paper here. Send it around both sides. Okay. So maybe if, in the context of what uh, Kim was presenting, you can just give a little thought. Give a little thought about um, to what you currently purchase locally or maybe what you'd like to be able to purchase locally that you don't currently. And then secondarily, what 
do you need? What would be useful to help encourage more local spending? And if there's anything, while you're thinking about that, if there's anything you've already thought about that applies to your organization, you can think, oh, you know, there's a block <coughs> right here. I wonder how we would get around that. Um, and you'd be willing to speak up and say something about that. I'm guessing there's other people in the room who would have something they could add to that and or rip off of. So is there anything at all that comes to mind? Might be interesting to know if you have, uh, like, um, you guys have local purchasing policies, or we're, we didn't actually talk to him about that. We're, we go in that purchasing manual right now, and, and we do intend to put something in. You know, and you know, we want to make sure that we're still getting value, but but we want to be able to give back to the mm -hmm. So, how many folks at this table, uh, your organizations currently have some kind of a, a preference, either formally or informally? So just a few, okay. All right, and those that uh, that don't, when you hear this kind of uh, a presentation and, and you start thinking about how things move around in your local economy, does, is that, does that seem like that's a useful strategy or? I think so, I think it's a great strategy. Um, our members are our community, obviously, for electric companies, so we wanna support that 100%. I was just thinking, I was just thinking about what I can't buy locally. So uh, for the electric utility products um, or items, we, we only we have two sources in the state, and that is uh, in Anchorage, which is really frustrating because we have North Coast here, we have Tesco, and, but their companies don't allow them to do heavy utility products in Fairbanks. And it's always frustrating me that I have to go to Anchorage get this product we don't have any choice you know we have to meet um, our us requirements and uh, you know, certain specifications um, to be funded by the USDA um, electrical um, laws but how that would be changed I have no idea you know you would think that North Coast could get buy-in from their company to sell to them at an industrial level Right. You know, it just boggles the mind that mm -hmm. we can't do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there are, I'm sure, if I what, set down. What was the product? That All of our electrical, our overhead, the transformers, underground, everything. We poles? Use, yeah. Poles, everything. Now, poles, we've. Do we I, need those? Yeah. Okay. Poles, we so probably are going to have to go out. Yeah, the but telephone. Yeah, <coughs> the Annexer, too. And, yeah. and Axler just came around not too long ago, right. a couple years ago. Yeah, before that, it HD. was just the telephone. Yeah. So. And they're not interested in opening up, you know, business up here and you know how much leverage we have so it's you know that's those are it's very frustrating yeah I would need more time to explore what what the law is and how to change it I don't I don't know the answer to that mm -hmm. or how it got to be that way sometimes how it got to be that way will save you a whole lot of time mm -hmm. in the long run <laughs> right, right. You know, I've talked to Mark Middleton at North Coast mm -hmm. So what I mean, what I mean by I just want to explain what I just said. One of the reasons that we are one of the only uh, states that doesn't uh, have any preference. We used to until 1990, and in 1990, Big D Construction sued the state of Arizona over what they perceived as uh, uh, being disadvantaged, and and they were backed by the um, con the uh, contractors association. You said the name of it earlier, and I've forgotten it again. There's a general contractors association. So they were largely controlled, this is so frustrating to me, but they were largely controlled by the state of California. The general contractors association was largely Arizona, or, I'm sorry, California contractors coming in. Now the state of California preferences their contractors 3%, but they are the ones who continually block Arizona because we have been this mecca of business for them. And they win a lot of contracts. And so they put 16 lobbyists against me last time. They were the ones who sunk me last time, yeah. They're a very powerful force in Arizona. I mean, think about the sprawl. I mean, we've been, contracting has been very big business, and so they control it. But it, the sad part is, is the Arizona contractors are, I mean, the vast minority on that board, and the decision-making comes from California. <laughs> well, we so. thought we should own the distributor, you know? Mm-hmm. It's all true for ourselves. Yeah. We would bring in more mm -hmm. total economy here. 
I think, though, that if, we, if you did a comprehensive study of what things are being purchased outside of here, some of those things are, are going to be very difficult. But some things might emerge as low-hanging fruit. And um, even if they're things that you can't buy locally right now, it will guide you to the type of companies that could start here and actually do really well. You had a question? Yeah, uh, state, local, federal, and private business. This makes sense. Uh, my question, since you've been out and about and asking people, on the federal side, has Arizona been able to have uh, do any experimental programs? I know it's a cookie cutter across the nation, federal. But have you seen any test beds for uh, local or state trying to find better ways to to um, that federal dollar local. I mean, we have our local, our federal programs, the 8A and Hub Zone, and these other different things that are kind of across the whole nation. But on a local level, um, you know, reaching out to these federal contracts, have you seen any anything at all? Or it's a touchy deal, so somebody doesn't sue somebody else. You mm -hmm. can't make an exception for one state. But there, I know there's been different test beds for different concepts mm -hmm. in different arenas. Mm -hmm. I haven't, and I, and I haven't done the research there either. I've not been looking at federal dollars at all yet, but I'd love to be able to stay in touch as these conversations advance because, you know, most of the government spending is for, for big ticket items, and it's, it's, it'll shock you. I've looked at government spending and how much of it goes to out, uh, other countries, how much of it goes to other countries' federal spending. So yeah, it's a lot, lot of the challenges. Good contracting uh, for <clears throat> staff up here and everything else, but some degree hands are tied by federal mm -hmm. laws and everything yeah and but there is open dis discussion and you know in different areas mm -hmm. and ways to improve and mm -hmm. i've always got my ear out and asked the question uh if somebody else has thought of an idea or played around with it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd like to stay in, yeah, I'd like to stay in touch with you on that. The types that, you know, it, it, we always tend to think of our biggest spends because that would be really great if we could move our biggest spends, but sometimes it's the little stuff that adds up. You know, one of the things that, that really, I think, threw the city of Phoenix into action was a simple screen printing contract. That sounds like the silliest thing ever, but the the city awarded the contract to print the fire, the city of Phoenix fire department to a company in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And when I went in front of the city council and explained, this is the type of stuff that I don't understand. And, you know, I do my best to work with procurement staff and not make any, I'm not going to get anywhere if I make enemies out of everybody. But they immediately said, um, that they wanted to, uh, or that they couldn't find a, a local screen printer. I mean, if you, if you can imagine, I live in a city of 4 million people. You can stand in a street anywhere with a rock and hit a screen printer that could have used a job in about 2010. This is when it was. And, uh, and, and that's when the city council just went, what are we doing wrong? You're like, this doesn't make any sense. So, and I pledged to roll up my sleeves and help the city. And so, do we have that video to play or not? The city of Phoenix video? Um, if not, it's no big deal. we've got it queued up. Okay. So the city of Phoenix just put out a fun video and I work with them. So my role has evolved into, okay, put up or shut up, Kimber, right? So I've been helping them build their vendor database so that they don't have to work so hard to find local choices. So I went out and got, you know, I could get 50, 60 screen printers in their vendor database. Then they can get a competitive bidding process going, right? I, again, I can't ask them to gosh, you know, I, I can't do my job because there's not enough local vendors in my database, right? So, for example, the city just put out this two-minute video clip that made it look like a new movie coming out, right? It was, they, they announced this streamlined process to get listed in the City of Phoenix vendor uh, outreach. And, 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 and as usual, cities are not very good at marketing themselves. And so I walk in and I'm like, you know, I might be able to help you guys with that. So what I do is I reached out to the Phoenix Chamber of Commerce, the uh, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, the, we have an organization called One Community, we have the Arizona Small Business Association. So I brought in 10 um, business associations to form a committee that meets twice a year to touch base with the city of Phoenix. And um, we all agree on the same information that we send out to all of our members. Here's how to register. And four times a year, the city of Phoenix hosts a discussion where businesses can come and learn how to get their business, how to bid more effectively, how to, how to go through the process. So because the city of Phoenix, they get overwhelmed with, oh my gosh, we can't, we'd be sending somebody out every week. 
And I said, no, don't do it that way. Let me help you. And so I brought in all the other business coalitions and we get in front of them. Uh, they have to present four times a year. They agreed to present four times a year. And we, as the business networks, do our best to get our members into the room, you know, and so you know, we're going to be replicating that for our universities and for our hospitals so that they don't have to kill themselves trying to reach this many um, locally owned businesses. My dream, in my dream world, we would have one database that all our municipalities can share. I mean, Phoenix, if you know anything about it, is a megalopolis, right? There are 23 different cities mushed together, and the small business owner has to go to 23 different cities and 23 different processes to get themselves listed in all those independent vendor databases. It's crazy. So I'd love to get them to be able to share. The state of Alaska had a Buy Alaska program. That was kind of a vision. Uh, it was strong for a long time. I don't know if any of the vendors were. Was that geared more toward consumers, or was that actually manufacturing and geared, cord, well, geared toward procurement? Of, it's a list. If you're looking for something, you look on that list before you call Seattle. I see. Say, you know, a lot, a lot of things, the universities, things they've known you for a while. Uh -huh. Say, hey, we're buying this, and, and well, wait a minute, we can get it local. The goal from that, that model was, Check on the list before you call outside. Yeah. And uh, it was strong for a while, but. The state still has a product preference. They are very adamant about taking uh, anybody that has any Alaska based business here to push them for that. And, um, so it's, it's mandatory. You have to share that with them. Mm -hmm. So is in that, in is, is that by Alaska's that list? Has, no. Has, 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 it, it's that. still it's, alive, and you guys have kind of. It's not the by Alaska list per se. Okay. It is an identified preference, however. So if we receive funds from the state, we're incorporating that, especially the agricultural and timber. So if we're building a building that has wood in their gymnasium or something like that, we need to look at if there's a vendor that can be a subcontractor that can provide um, their products. So we're, we're pretty. Is that a percentage that. preference or? The, the, the manufacturer's preference is uh, uh, tiered at uh, 35 and 7 percent, depending yep. on the amount of value add that mm -hmm. is performed within the state of Alaska. Mm -hmm. so. You mentioned that you, that list uh, you were the procurement officer for U UA and UAF? Correct. Uh, and, but not uh, UAA or, and UAS? Uh, no, I'm, uh, yeah, I, I'm the director of UAF, and then I'm the chief procurement officer for the system. Mm -hmm. UAA ha has a director of procurement. UAF has a single procurement officer, so no, most of their work comes to us. Okay. Mm -hmm. So one of the ideas would be to start thinking kind of creatively about the folks that you uh, connect with in the community and how your procurement decisions can potentially create those kinds of closed networks that Kimber was describing. I know that happens a lot in the mining industry where there's a need that's identified um, either internally or with a, 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 you know, a connection that someone's already got and even in a, in a closed sort of a loop is created in order to help meet a need, an immediate need. Um, so if there are things that come to mind, uh, we want to be able to start a conversation, one, for you guys to talk to each other, because it's not very often that procurement professionals get in the same room together. Um, so I would encourage folks to be able to, if you've got your cards on you, exchange cards, stay connected, start thinking interest, you know, in terms of uh, how you might review your current practices to identify some of these, some of these linkage areas um, through um, periodic audits. I know in some organizations the shipping costs are separate from the procurement costs and it's difficult to get the actual numbers, uh, but in some cases we potentially, if, if there's a collective approach to that, there might be a, a way to offset the expenses to be able to get that kind of information and be able to make some adjustments that are uh, actionable. Um, also in terms of uh, <coughs> uh, making your RFQs in such a way that there's a value added component built in potentially, particularly for those who don't have built in preference, local preference, to be able to look at additional value added as a, a variable in a way of making those decisions because it really does, particularly now in these, uh, in these trying times economically in the state, it makes sense to move the dollars around in the state. And the more we're connected with 
the actions, our actions, and as procurement professionals, there's, I just kind of mentioned that there's tremendous amount of power to make those decisions, but thinking in terms of how your actions can impact other aspects of your community directly. So you've got the paper in front of you, and uh, you know it takes a little bit of thinking, but if there's something that comes to mind that you can identify as an obstacle, I would like to do this, I don't know how to get through this particular regulation, we don't have um, a least our, or our groups don't hold hands in this kind of way. This kind of information, anything that you can offer to us as a starting point that we can help reach out and help you guys put your hands together and make these kinds of close, close loops and, uh, and stimulate the economy, we would want to hear from you. And one of the things as we move forward with this, <coughs> uh, uh, stopping the leakage is an is a old economic term, and, and it, but, it, but it is probably the fastest way to improve it, an economy, and, and Kimber had mentioned yesterday and, and today, you, you know, that a, that a rising tide raises all boats. Uh, and, and so when you think of, you know, your organizations, whether they're utilities or they're uni universities or they're hospitals or mines or whatever they are, uh, it, it not only, you know, makes your employees more successful, it makes uh, your vendors more successful, but al which ultimately creates more vendors and, and creates better competition. As we move forward, what, if you guys don't mind, uh, we're going to form a coalition of, of at least the supporters of this, include the Fairbanks Chamber, the Fairbanks North Star Borough, FEDC, and the Downtown Town Association, and, and, and start working on next steps. We'd like, uh, you know, kind of with your permission to be able to reach out to you and see how best we might be able to help you, uh, you know, help improve our economy, our, our collective economy. That's the goal. That's where we're headed. I, uh, I had the opportunity to, to, to listen to Kimber uh, last year when I was at the, the Economic Development Conference in, uh, in Anchorage. Um, and I, I said, we got to get that young lady up here <laughs> to talk to us because uh, it, it, it uh, just kind of will ask it by definition. We have huge leaks, but you know, if we work on it together, we can stop at least some of those leaks and make ourselves more successful. And I was thinking, um, like uh, FR clothing, our lady clothing. So we have a local supplier here that does the, uh, the best customer service. Um, and what I think it kind of does with the suppliers need to be educated. So let's say they carry a brand, like something like Woolworth. And anybody who's out in the craft having to wear this FR clothing, some of the stylers are more comfortable than others or more functional depending on whether you're a lineman or a meter reader or something like that, from, from like the pockets, whatever. So, um, uh, the, one of the favorites is Carhartt. And Carhartt, uh, we put in a big order for Carhartt, and Carhartt recalled like half of their order because uh, something happened, didn't meet the, uh, the FR mm. um, demand. And the local supplier does not, does everything they can not to get us Carhartt. It's just not their brand. They don't make as much money on it. Carhartt's hard to deal with. So there's yeah. another supplier that you can go online and order Carhartt, and it's in your shop in mm -hmm. two days. I have people who've been waiting three weeks just for FR um, undergarments. You know, so I think an education for our local businesses uh, on not just you know sticking into your comfort yep. zone, right, yep. and, and thinking that you're giving us the best service because you've got an FR product for us. You know, you're not climbing up below 50 below. So, you know, those <coughs> are an education. At yeah. the, uh, but we have some excellent uh, companies out there and excellent right. customer service. So I'm certainly not, you know, so no, and I, I hear you, and that's part of what we try to do. And, and I, I, you know, I, I stand here and say this, but I, I really hope you believe me. Nobody's going to do business locally if locally is not good, if they're not good enough. So we work really hard with our companies, and I think that there's a determination here to also work with them. You know, what, what comes to my mind is there's actually a mattress manufacturing company in Tucson that supplied the Tucson Fire Department for over 20 years. And his mattresses had a lifespan of about five to six years. And they got a new procurement guy who was very excited about this company called Jailhouse Beds, or well, they do jailhouse, but they, uh, there was prison and also fire. So they had firehouse and jailhouse beds. 
and they're made in China. And um, this guy was a Cracker Jack salesman, and he got in there and took that contract away from A1 Mattress, who for 20 years had been manufacturing these. So I'm the one who gets the phone call, rah, 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 you know, and he's irate because the city of Tucson is almost going broke. And here we've got uh, a contract going away and he's going to have to lay somebody off. And, you know, so I started investigating. And of course, you know, the mayor is hugely supportive of me, but he goes, now, Kimber, you know, this guy's saying, uh, you know, the price was, was, you know, at least 25% less. I, I can't ignore that with taxpayer money. So I said, I understand that, sir, and I'm not expecting you to, but did they tell you also that the lifespan of those beds is two years? He goes, what? <laughs> and I said, so they're not comparing apples to apples. Don't just look at the price tag. And so, but what bubbled out of that, and the reason I bring this up is because they became just slightly irritated and feeling like the local business had gotten cushy. He had that contract for 20 years. Things were a little late. They were a little this. And, and he just wasn't shining up. He wasn't showing up with shine shoes anymore, right? And so in that, we were able to sit down with him and go, you got to get better. You know, like it's not 20 years ago. It is today. And you can't just be comfortable with that contract. And so he got the contract back and he's working hard to keep it now. He's like, yes, sir. No, sir. What do I do? And um, so it really, it goes both ways. You know what I mean? And all of that bubbles up. And so I've kind of seen it all from all sides, you know. They get in a groove. Get out, yeah, know? yeah. That's actually a really good starting point uh -huh. because you named a specific tangible situation, that, and I'm sure every single one of you has at least one of these in your mind. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, um, you know, the obvious action would be to reach out and make the direct request if you have not already to the person that is in a decision-making position in a respectful way what your clear need is, and if it's not, we stated that. If it's you know, not, but we still uh, don't count the front, met, right? then that. <laughs> That would be one um, item that could be, for example, uh, added to a list of specific things that could have action as a result. It could be a matter of partnering to go over to you know, Big Rays or whoever it is and actually sit down and say, hey, how can we, actually, how can we make this work? And I get the sense that with the group that uh, Jim has just referenced uh, gathering that, that there'll be opportunities to do that. So I've had a lot of feedback from business owners over the past couple of years. We used to do statewide, regional things, uh, meet the agency. We used to do more of these where the actual end user would come in and meet the contracting officers. And then basically each of them would, it gets them off base. It's easier to get a, a room full of folks than to try to get each one of these folks, you know, knocking at your door. Uh, you just got a line, you got a lot of work to do. So how do we make it a little more efficient? match made it, making fast date, whatever you want to call it, but an opportunity to actually go back and forth and flush out some of these problems, introduce each other and things. Uh, we haven't had that in a while. Uh, that's come up a little bit more recently of what we can do locally. What have you found that works? Because you got all these people, you got a handful of contracting officers. Like I said, the city's under a budget. We can't, we can't just have a line out the door of people marketing to them nonstop. Eventually the door, you know, you gotta not answer the phone. How have you found a uniform way to actually get your locals to meet and market to and make sure there is a clear understanding uh, on, on what's available? Vendor pairs. Mm -hmm. So the business comes in that's interested. They set up a table. They've got their business cards. They've got lists of what they can do. And then you, as buyers, get the opportunity to just mix and mingle, meet different uh, people. You know, they better be, bring their best game. We. We've done this with food businesses with a giant, we have a, a locally owned grocery chain that has, um, um, I think 180 stores. And we put together just a supplier fair just for them <laughs> because they wanted to source more locally. And so we brought in everything from meat and produce suppliers to popcorn, I mean, and everything in between. And they brought in, probably 45 buyers who mixed and mingled and went around and took cards and looked at product, tried it out. You know, one guy, I remember he was so disappointed, but he makes a, a frozen, like a, almost like pop tarts, but his package wouldn't, wasn't made to stand up. And they just went, nope, we don't have a way to market that. Next. And he was all, oh, but, 
oh, you didn't even try it. And I was like, I know, I could live and learn, man. You're going to have to go back to the packaging guy. You know, he was like, but it gave him the opportunity to learn. You know, a year later, he's in the stores. He just had to start all over. But at the moment, it seemed like the end of the world. But that was so useful for him. Otherwise, he's going to keep knocking on the door a million times and he's not going to get the, you know, the deals. He never thought about that. How are they going to display it? And um, so anyway, um, that, that's just a point. I think vendor fairs are very useful. We have one here, it rotates between here and uh, Anchorage, at Procurement Fair. Uh, I don't know where we're at on that one, not the next one, but uh, that's helpful. Mm -hmm. We use the spritz in more, the, and there's way more businesses than there is uh, contracting officers. Yeah. You know, so yeah. the goal is to get the officers in one room and then invite everybody else that's work. But yeah. there's been a lot more need for that. And in a smaller community, obviously, it's a little different. We can't do yeah. one industry. That's, oh, no, no, no. I'm just giving you an idea. We do a lot of different ones. And we have a utility company actually organizes their own vendor fair. And they, and they call out to us and the chambers and others and say, if you have companies that you think would be interested, we've got 50 tables available. Invite them in. Has so. Like <laughs> no, and she's like a curse on you for bringing it up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And you're right, we don't have time. You know, you yeah, it is the touching time factor. I mean, I was just thinking as you're talking, I'm going to take the path of least resistance. A lot of time mm -hmm. I've got things sure. stacked up mm -hmm. like you all do, hundreds of you know, piles of paperwork on your desk. You, you know, sometimes you just yeah. uh, make the, the fast stuff. Yeah. So we know, go ahead. Yeah, I'm with the airports, and, and my hands are so tied on what mm -hmm. I'm told I need to do. Mm -hmm. uh, we have been partnering with the borough and everybody for the last two years. We've come up with one initiative, and it's taken us two years because the borough doesn't want to see federal acquisition regs in their contract, and I have to put them in there. So we've come up with an IGSA to do road striping, uh, and actually the Department of Transportation is doing it at cost. So even the cost savings is not a driver. Okay, so I don't want this to be on national so, TV, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll chat with you because we, we have a lot of federal dollars, so we actually. Well, we've, the and we've been, we've been meeting and we're going to continue to meet about every three months. We're partnering. Uh, we actually wrote a multiple award uh, paving contract uh, uh, for the Army. The Army can use it, uh, our contract, uh, so we're both using that uh, instead of just cherry picking the same contractor. Uh, I would tell you that most of our money goes locally just because. You know, locally it's cheaper because I'm not, you know, a lot, we buy everything from construction, you name it. However, if I'm buying office supplies, I'm, I'm mandated to go to the National Institute of the Blind, who then buy it from somebody else, and I go 100% small business unless there's an exception, such as a sole source, utilities, whatever. Uh, so I have very strict mandated mm -hmm. by Congress, so on and so on. So uh, as long as everybody else can say, well, okay, that's fine, but I'm going to have to put this clause so and so on in there. And that's why GPC is so, uh, everybody likes it because one, uh, wide area workflow, our payment system mandated if it's under par. GPC, it's not. So mm. if you want to get in there and do that, you know, now you're dealing with uh, 200 and some people that have been given my authority uh, to go out and do small micro purchases under 2,500 that can go to, you know, to the large business office max or whatever and do that buying. So when we have a vendor fair, probably 90% of the people that show up are really only interested in talking to uh, government purchase code, mm -hmm. uh, not the other things. And then uh, and then the other things like the big construction uh, with the local companies, large and small, uh, they're already very closely connected to us. So uh, they know the game and so on. And, and we spend a lot of money. I mean, a lot of money is flushed into Alaska, I know, by, by the uh, armed services. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we're, we're pretty mm -hmm. important apparently happy about that. But, mm -hmm. uh, 
I would love to spend every penny I have locally. It's, it's cheaper for me to do that. Now, the, the old, uh, you know, we go with the lowest price, uh, that was eons ago. Everything's uh, best value, uh, uh, performance, price trade off, so on. A lot, a lot more work, uh, mm -hmm. honestly, because the military, you know, the Air Force anyway, is so paranoid about uh, litigation. Nine times out of ten, everybody gets greened up on performance and ends up going to, in, in mm. actually many times, a low price anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and then again, because we're paying taxpayers, or we're spending taxpayers' money, uh, I'm not necessarily going to get the best stapler to begin with. I have to get my customer to go down to the absolute minimum to meet the, uh, their need, not the gold-plated model. Sure. Uh, which means that it might wear out in a month instead of lasting three or four years. If you get to more technical stuff like equipment, you know, heavy duty equipment and all, they are looking at, at those values and stuff. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's a good thing as taxpayers. I know you want to hear that. And I certainly pay taxes as well. But uh, that's why I haven't written anything down. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, mm -hmm. uh, but then again, there's the federal acquisition rates, which are 53 volumes supplemented five times and mm -hmm. change every day. Uh, a lot of it for the good, some of it not. So I could get a lot of stuff cheaper to go to large business side. I can't go large business. Wow. You know, I mean, That's if so I can determine that the large business is the only source that exists, now I can go. Mm -hmm. Saying that it's the cheapest, I'm growing small businesses, my mandate. Wow. So, I mean, that's a good thing. Ability One, or what they used to call an ISHA, and that's National Institute of Design, we do custodial and all through them. We pay more for that. Mm -hmm. uh, 8A companies, we pay about 25% more. Uh, and the government knows that, and they're, they want to spend that extra 25% to grow small business. Uh -huh. Of course, the small businesses appreciate that. Yeah. So it's not. But then it gets taken out of context on the news and beat you guys up by, uh, you know, they find that one hammer that you paid 25% well, yeah, more for. And, and it's, it's only those yeah. bad news stories that make the news. Yeah, and, yeah. And I'll tell you, those, uh -huh. and I've been in contracting 33 years, they're not bought locally, they're bought re, uh, uh -huh. you know, at systems level. Uh -huh. You know, that's, uh, you know, that's where they've got 30 people working on that, you know, uh, special titanium copy pot that's needed for NASA or whatever, that, and that one or that $500 bowl everybody's heard about. I've never seen it bought in my office, but mm -hmm. we compete everything. Yeah. 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 So, in reference to what you brought up about terms and conditions or what's required to be in a federal contract, um, you know, some of the vendors that are in town just trying to fail with them how to, when I talk about how to do business like at the federal or the state or the federal government, mm -hmm. a lot of them, they need to know how to fill out those requirements. Um, a lot of small businesses mm -hmm. don't have any idea what, if you have to fill out a department form, they don't realize that you have to go register it someplace and, and that's required of some of and that's what we do. Yeah, we spend a lot of time teaching them how to do that. Another thing we did with the city of Phoenix is we got them to change the insurance requirements. The, the insurance requirements were absurd for a, you know, uh, even a $25,000 contract. So we got them to change that. And pretty much they source locally for any contract under $50,000 now. Um, they source more on the bigger stuff as well, but I mean everything under $50,000 pretty much stays local. Well, they do have the Procurement Technical uh, Center, PTAC, yes. who normally uh, are, is the host for the... Uh, yeah, I'm kind of here sitting talking right about. here. Mm -hmm. so they're they're primarily here pizza. for that. Yeah. And, uh, and, of course, SBA, you know, so mm -hmm. yeah. there, that resource yeah. is out there. And you can Google that in any state, and mm -hmm. that resource is out there. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. uh, as well as you can come to the actual office. I mean, I'm, I'm available. I have people come out and do capabilities uh, meetings with me all the time. I recommend most times they just send me their capabilities briefing. Uh, but I would never turn anybody away if they want to drive up or fly up because a lot of people come up from Seattle and it's like, you know, you can just send me the information. I will, <laughs> I will farm it out to my people so they have it. Mm -hmm. uh, and and the last thing I'd like to say is there used to be a uh, an actual stipulation for us that it was first Alaska and it was construction and that was uh, mandated through uh, Senator Stevens, which no longer exists. But, mm -hmm. Uh, but there seemed to be a way around that. A lot of people would come in from Seattle and whatnot, get a uh, Alaska driver's license, and all of a sudden they're Alaskans. So, mm -hmm. uh, but there was a big push for that, but not on commodities, stuff like that that you guys are talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe just a quick show of hands for folks who do use a procurement card. How much of your procurement, or, or how many of you are using your procurement card uh, for Amazon purchasing? We, we start. We, a lot of people in our organization were purchasing through Amazon. Put a, it's, it's not allowed any longer in our procurement policy and our procurement handbook. 
mm -hmm. unless they cannot, unless it's truly the price is such a, a, a factor that they're allowed for that or they can't find it anywhere else. Because we do try to, we do have a local uh, bidder, besides the 5%, we do have a local bidder's preference for small dollars. We highly encourage them to try to use their local dollars with their procurement cards. Mm -hmm. We do, we hate Amazon, but <laughs> we don't like using our credit card links either. And the, the process yeah. of the paperwork, do we, everything we can if we get an Amazon order to try to source it in Fairbanks. I know that, but we get strange things that, you know, successful products, just IT things that are just, you know, specific to a certain part. Yeah, it's yeah. not going to be local. Sure. But, yeah. um, sure I don't like that work, and we're not out of control on that at all. We mm -hmm. just don't like to do it. So. Mm -hmm. There is a new study coming out on Amazon at the end of November that I encourage you all to read. We're doing our best to get it in as many publications as we possibly can. But it's pretty shocking how damaging they've been to the American economy. It's shocking. They're also, uh, yeah, they are going to prove that Amazon actually pays less on average across the board than Walmart. Yeah. Anybody here have any, besides myself, <laughs> have any problem with disposal of assets like, well, for me, it's going to be new transformers. Oh. We spend a lot of money to ship those down to mm -hmm. Salem because we don't really have a local source that we, is it going to end up as a Superfund type? Usually lose money. Yeah, so that Sometimes would be. Sometimes we'll break even depending on what you're spending. Might break as long as you're spending like a 750 KVA, it's it can yeah, like, exactly. you know three dollars per kilowatt on the bed. Yeah. I think when it comes to recycling anything, it, we end up paying a lot. And Interesting. Yeah, it gets chipped out. There's a company opportunity for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that or uh, Coleman, South Dakota, two of those TR metrics. He's even he gives you more per kilowatt than uh, really? the guy down there in California even further okay. away. We go to Salem. <laughs> shipped outside you know, because there's really not any other choice here. Yeah. It's, it's just that catch-22 that it, there's, there's not enough uh, uh, business within the state to create a viable economy of scale, so mm -hmm. that being the case, everything gets sent out. And it's very expensive for sure. It is. Mm -hmm. We you know, probably don't break even, probably. I do know that the uh, FNSB mayor's office is looking into um, or they're acting on a recycling program uh, which currently is being managed by one of the nonprofits in town and is in the process of uh, determining how that transition is going to happen and economy of scale is one of the big issues. So if, if there are specific um, areas that you can identify that you have, uh, that you're currently Paying to send back out that, that are recyclable that might potentially uh, help create the economy of scale necessary, for example, in the borough stuff to get that up and going, that would be an example of a kind of um, partnership. And they're starting specifically with paper plastic. And right. Down in Anchorage, there's a company that yeah, will take your transformer bonds, you give it to them, mm -hmm. and they'll take the oil out, maybe use it, maybe burn it, and then I'll know it. I do know that there's some creative thinking going on in uh, in terms of recycling and how to how to handle that. Um, so if if there are items that you can identify, that would be again useful information to either add to the paper or or add to the conversation going forward. Those kinds of those are the kinds of areas that actually we might be able to do something about if we have similar issues and we're trying to all spend our rubber tires out, for example. Or I think. Whatever. Recycling, period, is a problem up here. Because, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I mean, with hazmat, it's even worse, but mm -hmm. whether it's paper, aluminum, whatever, I mean, it's got to be shipped to the lower 48. So, for, for a very short time, we were recycling at, at no cost, and it was getting stockpiled in Fairbanks, and by basically a, a nonprofit organization that just basically run out of room and couldn't find any place to sell it. So then all of a sudden we tried to bid it and they wanted us to get the same thing we were getting for nothing to, to about 300,000 a year. So mm -hmm. 
and all it's doing in savings is we pay you know per ton for waste to go out and it, and it reduces the waste here and creates waste that somebody is putting in their yard and it's not going anywhere mm -hmm. because we don't have the up here in Fairbanks you know, we don't have the wrecking yards I mean whether it's to get a part for your car or to get rid of paper we were pelletizing paper for years until that piece of equipment that, that we had it's been gone for a while for the building down the borough bought it and so they were back uh, filling all the paper out of the borough to us yeah. and we were burning it with our coal and of course with 2.5 and so on and so on. There's been so much regulation that stopped a lot of that. So, <laughs> And it actually was, it, we weren't really making money off of it. If you looked at it, it, it looked really good like a lot mm. of recycling does, but when we, uh, uh, it was very dirty. So it, it created a lot more problems with the plants that uh, we were paying money out in other places. But all the time as far as senior leadership at Ileson, Wainwright as well, the borough as well. I know we talked about it, everybody is trying to crack the nut on recycling up mm -hmm. here. To get somebody that will, I guess, you know, decide to create, you know, take that step and create the company to do it. There is certainly uh, plenty to be recycled. It's just that you gotta find somebody that can set up a business to do it. Right now we just don't have it. So, uh, Corbius, we have a uh, privatized for housing now. It's uh, fairly new for Ileson. Uh, they are doing some limited recycling. I don't know who through. Uh, but it might be short-lived when they find out that it's, uh, mm. it's not, there's no payback. Mm -hmm. and every other place I've been uh, has had it, uh, and we're, we're quite a ways, certainly quite a ways from Anchorage, and then uh, we're, we're uh, quite a way via, via barge or whatever to get yeah, further, right. and that's, that's uh, with transportation, it's a challenge up here. Yeah. Well, it does have, it has, it has a uh, history that um, has been, I do know, but technology has advanced uh, to such a degree that a lot of the Great. Thank you all so very much for your time and input. And if you have other ideas, I'm sure Juliet and uh, the folks in her office would welcome it. So thank you very much.